Issue 142 We start out with Sonic and Porker being asked what happened by a banker who discovered gold missing. I was surprised at seeing Porker here until I remembered that he was brought back to Emerald Hill off screen for no reason. After Sonic asked the civilian why he called him over when this is a police matter, a strange thing for him to start asking now after all his heroism, and after Tails was asked for a second opinion on multiple crime cases. It's revealed that an old friend left a note behind saying that the robber would be back tomorrow night for the rest of the gold. Sonic agrees to guard the vault, and the next morning Sonic thinks nothing happened, but the gold was stolen anyways. Parker explains that conveniently, with no foreshadowing, he had apparently hidden a tiny transmitting device on one of the bars of gold so they could be able to track the thief to his hideout. Good thing he did that instead of just assuming Sonic could beat the thief like a normal person. Also, I wish he said tracking device instead of transmitting device. That would make it more clear what it's doing and how it's logical. Sonic lampshades that Porker didn't tell him about the transmitter, saying that he nearly looked like a fool back there. And Porker says that he was just trying to help. In the wrong side of town, Sonic runs up a building and threatens Fang through the window. Wait, how did he get undrunk? And, and Fang turns himself so small that he can't even be seen. So I guess they won't bother explaining how he got himself undrunk after he shrunk and really small the last time we saw him. When he was surrounded by atoms, he could possibly have the materials to make a uh, untrinking thing. He returns to normal and hits Sonic from the back, and he explains that when he was reduced to the size of an atom, he found a way to come back. Thanks for clearing that up. And now he's able to control his size in unbelievable ways. Predictably, he makes himself grow, and after Sonic thinks that he needs to go somewhere less cramped so he can use his speed against him, he gets attacked, and Fang's interrupted by police sirens. Because Porker took the liberty of calling them before he'd come here. He's so well prepared. So, so why is he coming on these missions? I thought he quit being part of the Freedom Fighters. Fang panics because there would be too many police for him to escape if he waits, so he shrinks himself to escape from Sonic. Porker explains that Fang had stolen the gold by shrinking himself in it, and at that size, any tiny crack in the vault would let him get through. Is this so-called scientific genius ever going to get a different gimmick than just a size-changing device? I mean, I guess that's more realistic than a genius inventor who can invent anything. It makes more sense for a genius to specialize in something. The story ends with Sonic being unhappy that he was outwitted and insisting he would have won even without Porker's help, when he wouldn't have gotten to Fang's apartment in the first place without him, with Porker condescendingly responding to that. The next story starts out with Techno and Amy surprisingly back in space, running along a golden cosmic interstate. Which is very surprising since they went back to Mobius through a portal last time. And we never saw any indication of the Ring of Eternity warping them again. Amy says that the interdimensional effect feels different, and the Ring of Eternity brings them back to Mobius, so I have a feeling that it's going to be in prehistoric times. They see some dinosaur alien invaders, with a refreshing exchange where it's lampshaded how obviously evil and theatrical one of them sounds because the other guy is so used to using planets for his needs, and Amy and Techno attack them. One of them says that his scanner showed there wasn't any intelligent life on the planet. Techno assumes that this means the aliens exterminated everyone, even though they're clearly talking as if they just came here and assumed it was always devoid of life. And she and Amy proceed to look mildly surprised at the idea that everyone on Mobius died, instead of just assuming they were sent to a different period of time from what they're used to. Again. The aliens put up a defense shield to protect themselves from one of Amy's arrows, as I realized that Amy and Techno traveling through various alien planets as, as heroes reminds me of when Sonic did that in Archie. Although, when Sonic did that in Archie, it was written way better. I think there was only one story in that whole arc that sucked. And then Techno's scanner reveals that there were millions of years in the past of Mobius. It took her a while to actually look at it and learn that. Also, the air was different like in the dinosaur times, so they wouldn't be able to breathe well. Then all of a sudden it's revealed that the Ring of Eternity was constructed by those dinosaur people so they could travel to other worlds, and they, cre and they created the spark of evolution on those chosen planets in the first place. Why were they just talking about using planets for their needs all evil like then? This comes out of nowhere, like it's a last minute change to the writing. 
The Ring of Eternity magically appeared to Amy Technum after seeing the past tests of strength and courage. It said it was omniscient and it was the spirit of Mobius. This is in direct contradiction with that, where all of a sudden it's an alien portal for aliens that basically created the people of Mobius, like in freaking Scientology. Where did this come from? And people act like the Zorda causing the mere evolution of the Mobian suit gene bombs was bad. At least in Archie, life still started normally, and it made sense to have something especially amazing happen to force the Anthro people to come into being in a human world. In Fleetway, there's no reason for why there's humans and Mobians and humans who kind of look like animals all living on the same planet. Amy then reveals out of nowhere that they are indeed responsible for all life in the universe. She just made a wild assumption when I assumed more realistically that these aliens were only talking about a few planets, not playing God by being responsible for all life other than their own, for no reason. I mean, I guess they want to play a you owe me by returning to the planet later and saying that, oh yeah, we created you. I mean, I don't hate this concept, uh, I guess. It's pretty interesting, but I'd be much less hostile to it if it wasn't in direct contradiction with what the Ring of Eternity said about himself. And if they were only responsible for creating primordial life in worlds other than Mobius, not Mobius itself. Uh, I, I prefer Aurora, where, where Penders was making Aurora the creator goddess of the world, although it's implied later by Flynn that she wasn't always a goddess, but still, like, I would have accepted, like, a creator goddess more, because it's a fantasy universe. I'm guessing the reason they're doing all of this is to make planets have their century life develop technology and stuff for them to steal, since one of them clearly talked about using the planet for their needs, but they're thinking very, very far ahead in the long term then. Why would they bother? Then they're not going to live to see that. Suddenly once- wait, wait, are they using time machines so they can warp ahead in time and then they can steal the technology when it gets advanced enough? But if they have that kind of technology, they would have that advanced technology for themselves anyways. Why would they need to steal it? Suddenly, once again, the Ring of Eternity reveals that he knew all about this and showed them this as a reward for the work they've done. So he lied about him being the spirit of Mobius? He can't be the spirit of Mobius and be a man-made alien creation. Was he imbued with the spirit of Mobius after he was built by those guys? I guess so, maybe by a cult, but he doesn't explain that. He says that there's still many adventures in store for Amy and Techno, as I wonder why none of their friends have asked where they went and started looking for them and putting out a missing persons report for them. This is like Snively's disappearance from Knothole. No one's questioning it. Amy lampshades that she always thought there was another creator of life, and after I'm relieved at the dinosaur person saying that there is and he works for her, so it's not completely weird since maybe they work for like Gaia or Chaos. Well, well not Chaos. I don't know why people talk like Chaos is a substitute for God in the Sonic universe. He's just a blue mutated chow. That, that seems kind of terrestrial to me. But anyways, Amy and Techno are warped away once again. That was a lot to take in. At least they tried, but that was so sudden. Again, at least the Zorda didn't create all life from the very beginning. We start out the next story with seeing a giant statue of Sonic on top of a pedestal with the word freedom on it, which I'm sure Sonic specifically requested to be built of himself from his ego. And a text box explains that every year, Green Hill Zone's residents celebrate Victory Over Eggman with a firework display. Each year? So it's been two years since Victory Over Eggman, when it's only been 42 issues? How slowly did the issues of Fleetway come out? Also, I would expect that that Eggman Effigy Burning Day would be how people would celebrate him being taken down. Tails says that the giant rocket is even bigger than Sonic's statue. Sonic won't be happy about that. The rocket's in a giant milk bottle, and one of the civilians says musingly that finding a milk bottle big enough was the hard part. After the rocket launches, predictably something goes wrong and the rocket goes haywire because of a new villain, Mad Ferret. You know, it feels arbitrary that Tails is having adventures on his own when he's not forcibly whisked away to another dimension. In the sense that you'd expect Tails to be spending all of his time with his friends. But instead he somehow is alone, and so he gets tons of stories and Mobius to himself. In the Nameless Zone, it made sense that he was alone. They, they, they could have very easily explained this. That, that since Sonic's a jerk to him, it makes perfect sense that he'd willingly spend time without him just to get a break from him. And to try to prove himself as a hero on his own. 
But then we see Tails willingly spending time with Sonic anyway, so why isn't Sonic here? Tails tries to fly away with people to evacuate the village, but then it's revealed that the rocket is targeting Sonic's statue. The people of the village start to despair because their symbol of hope and freedom was destroyed, even though it can easily be rebuilt, and this turns out to be his own motive, as he's hoping that it'll only be a matter of time before Eggman rules again. Why didn't the heroes tell everyone what happened to Eggman? Maybe they did, and the Eggman fanboys are just in denial about it, and they just assume he'll come back, being genre savvy. After the superstitious town folk panic about the possibility of Eggman coming back, talking about it like it's a certainty, Tails reassures them with a rousing speech that they can always beat Eggman again. Then out of nowhere, one of the villagers says he never liked the statue anyways because it blocked the sunlight to his garden. Which makes sense, but I thought he'd love it because it was a symbol of hope. And a statue of Sonic. It would've been more endearing to me if he said he didn't like the statue because Sonic's ego is big enough as it is. As the villain's being handcuffed, he says he's surprised at his rousing speech because he heard he was a wimp. Did you not hear about any of Tails' many solo adventures? And Tails reveals why his character development happened, because fighting villains changed him for the better. It was kind of a sudden shift though. Starting with the tantrum story, he went from a useless idiot and coward to being how he's supposed to be just like that. Am I crazy or do I prefer Fleetway Tails of all the other Tails? Like aside from, if he was an engineer or a mage, it would be perfect. But the way he's now, like, he's the most sympathetic out of all the Tailses, because I feel so bad for him being dismissed as just the sidekick all the time and bullied by Sonic. And I always thought that what Tails was missing the most was us having a reason to feel sorry for him. Like in the origin of the Unbreakable Bond, he had a tragic backstory in that fanfic because he was bullied a lot. But here, like, he, he is bullied by Sonic. Like, the only problem is, like, he's not an engineer, he's not an outright genius, but maybe he doesn't entirely have to be, at least this makes him unique. Although I prefer if he was smarter. And the last story is just a reprint. The first story was by Nigel Kitchen, and was about Fang once again using his shrinking device, using it to subtly steal some gold from a bank and to escape from the police scot-free later on. At least he has a gimmick, but he's not that impressive as a scientific genius if he has only one major invention he's obsessed with, when every other inventor genius in the Sonic franchise is a do-anything genius. Logically, Sonic never should have even found Fang, because, well one, Fang never should have gotten unchunken from atom size, but two, because Porker should have assumed that Sonic would beat the thief instead of thinking to put a tracking device on a bar of gold for a ridiculous possibility. The second and third story to by Lou Stringer. With the second one, it was a lot to take in. Apparently, it turns out that the Ring of Eternity is not the spirit of Mobius, or maybe it still is, but instead it was made to be a portal by alien dinosaur people who gave Mobius his first primordial life in the first place. Sounds like something straight out of a certain cult that Mr. Cruz is a part of. At least they're revealed to be working for a creator themselves, which is much better. But we never see her, so it still feels wrong. It feels totally unnecessary. I'm pretty sure they would have developed life without them. We have the totally unnecessary and impossible to swallow revelation that these guys alone are responsible for every planet in the universe that has life having life on it. Not just a few planets like I assumed. What are they, mortals? It's not like being different is bad. I don't care if it's not Sonic game-esque enough. It's just that it feels contrived as all hell retconning who the Ring of Eternity is, and it's very sudden. They started out acting like alien invaders, with one of them saying the planet is ripe for their needs, and suddenly they're now something else entirely. It's like the Fleetway equivalent to the Zorda created Mobians accidentally for gene bombing the humans, only with Archie, it made a lot of sense explaining why the fuck humans and Mobius shared a planet together, evolving the regular animals. So it felt, it felt kind of necessary to explain the discrepancy. It was very, very nice of the comic to bother to explain them, they didn't have to. Well, with Fleetway, I could have gone my whole life without knowing this. And the final story has an Eggman fanboy destroy a statue of Sonic that commemorated Eggman's defeat two years ago. And Tails reassures the despairing civilians that it'll all be fine. 